every single one of you and Natasha's cow. <laughs> oh, Daniel sends a $2 super chat. Thank you very much. That's a great way to start a Monday. Much appreciated. Hey, Jerry, Nathaniel, Leaf, uh, G Hags, Nathaniel. Chastity says, got my compost your enemy shirt and love it. Viewed it strictly as turning my pest and weed problems into a solution. Seems like everyone else thinks it's horrible and mean. Plenty of space in the compost pile for them. They don't understand. Gee, I said, super excited for this one. This year will be my first with a proper 300 square foot garden and I could use all of the information I can get. Yes, I think a lot of people are in that boat. Everybody starts gardening. Everybody starts gardening at some point. Uh, it's really, it's kind of, uh, it's interesting, you know, I, I have this, I have a banjo. I'll show you my banjo. Some of you guys have seen it. I have this inexpensive five-string banjo. I have to cut these extra strings off. It's kind of, kind of crazy. So I have this banjo. So I, I looked online and I found a couple of chords. So, you know, I'm, I'm a guitar player. I'm a good guitar player. I'm not like Eric Clapton levels, but I'm good. So I'm thinking, you know, the banjo can't be that hard. So to noodle around on the banjo and make it sound cool, you could do, I could do like cool stuff on it, you know? But uh, to actually play it properly, that's a, whole different, that's a whole different thing. So I was looking up on Sunday afternoon, I looked up a banjo lesson, and I was looking up claw hammer style banjo. Who would have thought that it is so stinking hard to make your hand hit things in time while you pluck with the other? It's a very different, it's like. Except 300 times that fast and syncopated. It's like, oh my gosh, how do you do that? Well, you do it one bit at a time, I guess. You have to learn the, the, the bare basics of it, and then, then you're doing this. So anyhow, one, one of my children also wants to learn the banjo, so she, uh, she borrowed the banjo today, and I said, why don't you watch that Clawhammer style uh, video there? And So I, I, I was out, I was working on the porch, I was, I was watering some stuff on the porch, and I hear her play the banjo once. And then I go inside like three minutes later and she's just putting the banjo away. I'm done. I said, what do you mean you're done? She goes, I watched a video on how to play banjo. I didn't understand any of it. And I think, you know, that's our, our natural inclination. You see something, somebody doing something really well and you say, there's no way. I can't do that. I can't do that. I, I mean, you, you go and you see like the, the lady down the road and everything is perfect in her garden and she seems to know everything. I mean, she knows what NPK stands for. Yeah, North People's Republic of Korea. Um, you know, and so you, you, you look at like people that are doing things really well. I watched this video of this Mexican guy grafting and I was like, holy moly. I mean, Nip, shoo, pop, boom, stick those things in there. Shoo, doo, pop, boom, boom, just going down the row. And, and for him, it's no big deal. It's practiced the practiced hands of a master of his craft. My, my grandfather built boats. I can't build a boat. I could barely build a shed. And uh, for him, he had all the curved pieces of wood. He did all the beautiful work and everything. It's different. So when you look at it for the first time, you say, this is absolutely overwhelming. I cannot handle this. This is above my pay grade. I am not good at it. And then the inclination is to say, I will never be good at it. I don't have it. 
I have a black thumb. I kill everything, you know. I have tried to, to get people to write books before. I've explained how I write a book. Break it all down into pieces, bit by bit. You gotta do a bit at a time, then you can write a book. Most people won't do it because it, it really takes, it takes concerted effort over time and it takes learning, learning a craft. And I was fortunate enough that, you know, to be homeschooled and to have my dad stay on my case and teach me how to be a good writer over time. And then I had bosses. I got a job doing writing for a living, writing radio copy, and I had to do it bit by bit. And eventually you're really good. Well, if you have a little bit of discipline, you could do the same thing in the garden. But gardening, I'll tell you what, it's not nearly as hard as learning claw hammer banjo. And I know this because I took one claw hammer banjo lesson and it's way harder. So, but there's, you know, there's a ton of stuff that you have to figure out to get started. So all of this was inspired by Peter. Uh, Peter Birch, who wrote an article and he sent it to me at thesurvivalgardener.com. If you don't visit my blog, I know blogs are dead. They're a thing of the past. They're so 2010, but I still maintain a blog website with tons of information on it because I'm an old fashioned type. But he wrote, he wrote me this article and as I was uh, formatting it for my site and writing a few notes on it, I thought, this, this is exactly how you do it. And uh, he starts out, you can, you can read uh, the link. There's a link below uh, this video. It says, read Peter's story here. There's a link. So um, you can see what he did. He writes, it's February 2019. Almost a year since I planted my first edible plants in my backyard. So one year after, he's doing the one year in review. I can't remember when exactly I decided I was going to grow some edible plants. It would have been sometime in 2017 that I really committed to it. That's when I started preparing the first garden bed. I also can't remember exactly when the interest began, but I've been dabbling in weird composting for a few years. The interest came from a number of things that I've been considering for a while. Things like a desire to work with my hands rather than just do my office-based work. A concern about the Sorry, I lost my place here. You know, don't you hate it when you're in the middle of something and then like there's a pop-up on your computer that goes, hey, it wasn't a pop-up on my website, by the way. I do have one, but it didn't pop up. <laughs> a concern about industrialized food production and the associated waste products, consumption of resources, damage to land, and loss of nutrients. A desire to at least know how to produce food outside of the industrial system and wanting to be a good steward of my own land to improve it and put it to use. So... The first thing he talks about doing is he liked the idea of permaculture and food forest design. So he started like, let's do kind of a more of a forest garden design. And he decided to commit to creating an edible garden. And he wanted it to be a food forest. But then he writes, the main aim of my first garden was to test my own commitment and to hopefully show my wife that it wouldn't ruin our backyard. To do this, it needed to be small and reversible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my wife has just realized that I make horrible messes everywhere and she's completely given up. So, Peter, you're, you're a good man. I wanted to use layers of plants, mostly perennial, with a mixture of edibles and beneficials. Herbicides and pesticides were not to be used. So, what he did was, he mulched an area, he planted a, a variety of different perennials, he started some things from seed, and then what he did is he wrote down the plants that he tried. Acerola cherry, bishop's crown chilies, cow peas, golden eggplant, garlic chive, greater yam, that's uh, Dioscoria alata, uh, katuk, lemongrass, mandarin. He's also in a tropical climate. So for some of you guys starting a first garden, obviously this is out there. And you might not start with perennials. Uh, Mexican coriander, moringa, uh, mushroom plant, snake bean, sweet potato, Thai basil, tomato, Thai pink egg, Welsh onion, winged bean, cucumelon, and pineapples. So he start, he, well, he's just gonna go, I'm gonna plant all of these things. But then what he did was he wrote notes on it, on, on how they did. So Mexican coriander, he writes, very slow to germinate. It has struggled along and is not as easy to use or as nice to eat as regular coriander leaf. The seeds were bought online. Uh, 
the Katuk, he says, I have just planted this in a no-dig garden bed in partial shade. It was bought online as tube stock. Um, so, so he's making notes as he goes and saying, okay, this worked and this didn't. Um, so as he's, as he's paying attention, like he says, winged bean, my first try of these was a failure. The plants that came up didn't look right and never really got going. I have bought new seeds online and I'm trying again. Uh, Cuckoo Melon says, this grew well but did not yield well. I gave up on it and cut it out or have come up in its place. Um, and he writes all the things I've done badly. He writes about the location issues he's had, uh, plants in blazing hot sun, putting sweet potato around a tiny moringa tree, thinking they would get plenty of sun, uh, mistaking a weed for Thai basil and feeding it to my wife. <laughs> I think I've done that before. Um, growing things I hadn't tasted, then finding out I didn't like them. It's okay if not much has been invested. And he writes things I've done well. Having a, grow, having a go at growing food. It's fun. Eating food, I grew myself. Having a section of garden that can handle chop and drop. So easy to look after. Getting soil tested. I would never have thought that I needed copper or boron. Reading and listening to other people. There is so much to be learned and it doesn't all have to be the hard way. Not always listening to other people. It's fun to experiment. Finding people who grow things in the same climate as me in different countries and seeing what works for them. I found lots of plants I'd never heard of. Then often found local people who are in the know are already growing them. Finding use for all my green waste by composting, mulching, and cutting firewood. I don't have to dump any. Having a go at no-dig gardening. It has made some good soil with very little work, especially when compared to the first garden I did. Writing a year in review. It has been good to think back over the first year and write down some of the things I've done and learned. Getting my wife outside. My wife always supported me making a garden because she loves me. As the garden develops, she has found she likes the way it looks and likes eating food we've grown. That's what she says, anyway. So then, and then he writes down some of his future goals. Uh, grow some small trees that could be coppice for firewood, to grow some bananas, to grow and propagate his yam plant and his katuk, uh, to fix the drainage issues in the backyard, to, to successfully grow winged beans, to expand composting capacity. This is fun. This is good stuff. So he's got, you know, a great big article that he wrote and this essay on what he learned from one year of gardening and let me show you Peter sent me this picture here this is the first I'll move over here and expand it a little bit so you can see a little more this is this is what it looked like a little while after he put it in you can see he's got some perennials in there he's got some uh, pineapples and some other things that he's put in the ground and this is that area from a slightly different angle a year later Look at that great big moringa tree. Look at that good stuff growing around the edges. It's nice and thick, you know. Uh, look at all the all the mass of leaves on that moringa. That's a lot of uh, potential food, not to mention medicine, from one tree. You can use those leaves like spinach, and they're also a very good supplement. My my wife makes moringa tea. Uh, has been making moringa tea and drinking it every day. And um, a nurse friend of ours swears by it. She says that it has really given her extra energy helped her feel more fit and fights arthritis and all kinds of other things really a great tree even if you just pl plopped one tree in the ground you would be successful so basically what I'm gonna tell you about starting your gardening the best way to start your garden is to just start it doesn't matter if you decide to put some tires on the ground and fill them with dirt, if you decide to build a nice raised bed, if you decide to dig a melon pit, throw all your kitchen scraps in there, plant a few melons on top. What I want you to do is to lose your fear of gardening and realize that every time you're out there and growing and planting different things, it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to worry that you're doing it the wrong way. You can always start over. You can always plant something else. You plant a whole bunch of stuff. You plant things too close together and they don't develop well. You get a bunch of little beet greens but no beets because you thought you could plant them a little closer or you didn't thin them out in time. You've learned. Cut the greens off and put them in a salad. 
but you've learned something there. Every time you're out there and doing it, you're learning. And, you know, Peter's right in that he says, you know, some of the best thing, one of the best things he did, one of the good things he did, was he listened to other people. And one of the great things he did was just experiment and not worry about what other people said. You know, you're getting the, the hands-on approach. Um, you learn really quickly what works and what doesn't in your backyard by trying. You know, um, today, for example, I went over and I looked at my land. And I know now, after gardening here for three years, that cutworms are a bad issue. They just come in and chop stuff down. And I learned this uh, because as soon as I got here, I started clearing garden beds out and planting, even though we were renting. You could see some of my old videos where I'm using the little raised beds at the rental house that we had. I'm out there digging in the ground. We planted a bunch of stuff and I planted just like I planted in my old Florida garden. I did the 13 bean soup garden. I got a bag of dried beans and I decided I'm going to plant some of every type. I'm going to plant some of all of them and, and mix them up in the rows. Well, I did this great video on it and it would have worked in Florida. And sure enough, quite a few of them came up. But then one by one, sometimes two by two or four by four, they disappeared in the night. Chop! I'd come out and the bean was laying over or the top of it was just simply messing. Cutworms were coming and chopping through all the beans. So my demonstration garden with the beans was a failure because of the cutworms. Um, I did a demonstration on planting chayote squash. I had done that successfully in Florida. I, occasionally they would not they would not take, but I had about a 50-50. Some of them would take, some of them wouldn't. I did the same thing here and all of them failed. Every one of the chayote, something got into the root and chewed it up and they died. I, uh, I grew potatoes wonderfully in Tennessee. I had a mulch bed, a deep mulch bed, and I had been going dumpster diving and I saved a bunch of potatoes from the store and I just threw them on the ground and I covered them with mulch and uh, like early spring and they all started popping up and I harvested all these beautiful different multicolored potatoes out of that bed. It was like no work. I mean you're not even supposed to plant grocery store potatoes. That was evil and wrong and bad, right? But I did it and, it, and I got all these potatoes. Well, guess what? I go to Florida. I do things the right way. I, I, I dug the trench and I put the pieces in and I even had some uh, compost and everything. Like everything was right. The potatoes started to grow. They looked rich and green and healthy. And then they started to turn yellow. And I thought, are they maturing already? That doesn't seem right. And then they just died. I don't know what the heck is going on. Well, I, I started to pull one of them up to see what happened. And a flood of fire ants comes over my hand. What the heck? Fire ants? Fire ants are in the potato. Turns out the fire ants got into the base of every potato and they chewed through the roots. I've never seen anything like that before. I didn't know I didn't know fire ants would do that. Well, guess what? I learned. I don't say I'm a failure. I will never grow potatoes again. I have to figure out how to get rid of the fire ants before I grow if I'm going to grow in that climate or I need to move back to Tennessee. So you by doing it, you will learn exactly what works in your yard and what doesn't work in your yard. And you will make mistakes. And those mistakes will be your teachers. Now you can skip a lot of the mistakes by asking experts. But if you ask me, if you're from Maine, and you ask me what variety of corn is best for Maine, I can make an educated guess based on my reading. I might go online and read some extension service uh, you know, from New Hampshire, and I say, well, that's pretty close. It's probably some. It's probably would be a flint corn variety. You're growing a grain corn. It would be a flint corn, a shorter period type. Yeah, I would try so and so's Rockies Red Giant or whatever, you know. Um, but I wouldn't know as well as the lady down the road from you who likes to grow it and, and make her own cornbread. Um, and she wouldn't necessarily know as well as if you asked a dozen people or if you found all the short season corn varieties you could and you planted them from year to year or you planted them all at the same time and let them interbreed and you got a corn that was exactly suited to your backyard. You know, I, I planted popcorn when I was a kid just to see what it would do when it grew a little popcorn. It was kind of cool. Um, I, I planted beans. I planted uh, just about anything anybody gave me. I would plant it even if I didn't like to eat it. 
I grew okra in my wife's rose garden. She didn't like okra, but I just wanted to see what it grew like, so I planted it in the open space in between her roses. I was like, look at those beautiful flowers. And she's like, what are those? I was like, it's so weird. It looks like some sort of a hibiscus. <laughs> it's so amazing my wife hasn't composted me yet. But um, it's, it's, it's testing. It's trying. It's not giving up. And it's doing a bit at a time. And it's not getting discouraged. You don't go, I don't, I can't pick up this banjo. Look at, I can already play guitar. I pick up this banjo and I'm like, Claw hammer. Okay, I put my hand like this, and I know there's a strike, and a brush, and a ping. Okay, that sounds bad. I don't know how to do it. Okay, I am a guitar picker. Now I can take my guitar pick and be like... That's not the way you play the banjo. I have to start over again a little bit at a time, figure out what works, figure out if I'm a finger picker or a claw hammer type, and bit by bit, I will learn the, the banjo. Now, the guitar, just like gardening, I didn't just pick the guitar up and learn to play. My mom had a battered classical guitar where the top was half falling off it, and she had played it when she was in high school or something. And I picked it up, and I looked up a book of some chords, and I would sit there and like, there's the G, and then I would try to switch, and I'd go, there's the D, and I would sit there and pluck it, and then I got to bar chords, and the bar chords are where you have to put your finger all the way across and make a clean note like this. All the notes have to be clean. Now most of the time when you do a bar chord for the first time it sounds like this. It doesn't play, or you're like, it's horrible. So I, I, I was like, okay, this has gotten complicated. I could do this. And I was like, oh, I've got my E chord. And I've got my A chord. But when I got to the bar chords, I was like, I quit. I can't do it. My fingers hurt. I don't know how to do it. And then there was um uh, a guy from our church and he played the electric guitar and he played really nicely and it was a year after I had started trying to play and I had given up and he had his guitar plugged in in his living room and it sounded so great when he played I said I wish I could do that and he said oh yeah you could do it why don't you get yourself an electric it's a little easier to play and now instead of playing this classical guitar with this really high action and the broken top I got a used electric guitar my fingers fitted a little better and I followed this guy around and I learned some more chords from him. My boss at work knew how to play, so I learned a bit from him. And I stuck to it. And, and in two years, I had a band, which was not a very good band. It was terrible, uh, absolutely awful. But after playing with a drummer uh, for a year or two, uh, my rhythm got way better. And I got to the point where when I play guitar, people turn around and they go, that sounds nice. Wow, you can really play guitar. Well, you can really garden. It's a bit at a time. And what I needed was, was to learn that, okay, I wasn't a failure because I couldn't play bar chords. I needed to learn how to play bar chords, but maybe my fingers just weren't strong enough and the guitar wasn't right. You know, if I'm trying to grow beef, steak, tomatoes in the tropics, everything likes to eat beef, steak, tomatoes. Maybe that's not right. You know, you need to start with, um, start with your cherry tomatoes. You want a productive tomato? Start with the Everglades tomato, particularly in Florida. The thing is a monster. It's like a, it's like a weed. I mean, they show up in people's yards. Um, there's a rumor that they originally originated in a septic tank. I don't know about that, but um, I guess that's what the Everglades is. The river of... No, no, no. That's not, that's not very nice. It's nature's septic tank. A big festering swamp which happens to provide all of the water and biodiversity of the entire state. But anyhow, what I want you to do is, you know, what, what Peter is doing here, Peter says, okay, what can I learn in a year? What, what can I do? Okay, my drainage was bad. I'm not going to do that. I got this eggplant, but it was seedy, and I didn't like it, so I'm not going to grow that one again. This thing didn't produce well. I didn't identify this properly. I, uh, I found out that 
they need more sun. The sweet potatoes need more sun. They're not making big enough fruits. That's fine. I, I mean, that's how you learn. Um, I don't, I don't write gardening books like out of the blue. My gardening books are built on millions of dead plants and experiments and failures. And bit by bit by bit by bit, I learned over the years that I, I have a pretty good chance that I'm going to be able to identify that and nail down the family, nail down the genus. Um, I'm going to be able to grow that thing here, or that thing is probably not going to do very well, or that one looks like it'll go from cuttings, or it won't. So you start to the more of the luck goes out of it, and the skill starts to come in, and you realize, you know, if you strip all of the, um, you know, you till up clay at the wrong time of the year, it turns into a rock, and the Bermuda grass just comes through it, and you can't garden in it. I made that mistake. I did the tire garden thing, and then realized that uh, I had built not only brought a bunch of trashy tires to my property, I had uh, built it in a place where as soon as the leaves came back on the trees in spring, my entire garden was in the shade, right? The whole thing was in the shade and I thought it was a pretty good gardener. Stupid mistake. Well, guess what? The next year I moved it. You know, you just move it, right? So it's a, it's a matter of, of, of testing and experimenting and enjoying it and figuring out where the successes come in and you know and sometimes just throw it out if I tell you something go ahead and try it you know a lot of people have tried my anaerobic compost tea and they say this stuff stinks but it works really well on my plants it's great that you tried it because a lot of people would just say meh I don't really want to try it you know um, I'm just gonna go buy some fertilizer you know, whatever. I mean, I want to keep throwing my brush by the side of the road. I don't want to bother composting it. When you see the amount of compost you can get, when you see a seed that you planted develop into a fruiting tree, that's like, that's a major success. And every one of those little successes that you've earned, you can be really proud of. Peter can be proud of taking this little patch right here and growing this great big beautiful lush spot this is like a little oasis it's like a tiny little forest in his backyard little perennial herbs and vines and i mean that's great that's the way you do it and and what he did was is he cataloged his failures and he cataloged his successes if you go to my my website uh the survival gardener you'll see that every year i do a year in review post and then i do a goals for the year post and i start with Look at what worked this year and what didn't work this year. How were my yields? What what great thing did I do? What infrastructure improvements did I make? And it's been difficult the last few years because I've been renting, but you can see a pretty steady increase over time in yields from my old uh, on my old Florida homestead, and then everything just kind of goes crazy because I'm I'm renting and it's up and down and all over the place. But you do it bit by bit by bit, and you learn. And what I want you to do is to realize you are going to learn. Look at it as a learning experience where you don't have to be an expert. Um, if all the knowledge in the world that is possible in all of history forever and ever, we're never going to know any more than like a microscopic dot on there. I'm not a physicist. I don't have very good music theory. I don't know how to play the bassoon. I don't, I can't name all the countries in Africa. I can't even name all the countries in Europe. Um, there, there's knowledge that people have that you don't have. And you don't have to feel like I am a complete failure because I don't know everything. If you want to learn how to garden, start gardening. I mean, in Florida, you could read my book, Totally Crazy Easy Florida Gardening, where I break it down. This is based on killing lots and lots of plants and figuring out which ones survived well, which ones don't, which ones were a pain in the neck, and which ones were successes. And the, the Marion County Extension Office is now following the, the methods that I was working with. Let's find out what grows the most amount of food for the least amount of work. But it takes work to get there. You know, I want you to just, okay, you like John Jeevan's biointensive approach. Go ahead and dig a bed, double dig a bed, do what he says in the book, and then plant stuff and see what does well and what doesn't do well. You like an anarchistic approach. You want to go to the dollar store and buy 15 packages of seeds and scatter them over the ground and see what grows. 
great. See which ones survive. See which ones take off. If you like square foot gardening, my wife got into gardening through square foot gardening because it was understandable, it was containable, and it was neat. And she liked that sense of order and that sense of each little box I can move things through and I have a specific spacing and the soil is perfect and we don't have to weed. Do it. Do it and learn from it. I did square foot gardens. I did double dug gardens. I buried wood and planted over the top of it. I dug pits and buried goat organs in them and planted on top of them. I, uh, I pollarded trees. I coppiced trees. I pruned my own grapevines to figure out how to do it right. I didn't prune them back enough. And then I ran into Dave Taylor at Taylor Gardens Nursery. I saw how he pruned them. I learned how to do it properly. And my grape yields went up. I started seedling peaches and I planted, I started a bunch of seedling peaches. I gave a bunch away. I planted them all over my yard. I got lots of peaches from seedlings. Nobody's really sure if they're going to make good peaches or not. They all made good peaches. I learned it and you can learn it too. So, so the worst thing to do is to just sit around and planning, just sit around and plan and look at different stuff and, and say, I'm a failure. Every time you screw up, you're not a failure because you're not dead yet. Just keep going. Do the next thing. Fail your way towards success. Um, on the unauthorized.tv channel that uh, started, I've got I put up my um, better gardening through experimentation video, and that's basically failing your way towards success. So that's what I want you to do. I want you to get gardening and start whatever whatever interests you. Try growing it. Try growing a few different varieties. Try growing five different types of beans. Okay, you got two of them that did really well. One of them you didn't like the flavor of. Okay, well that one that did really well, that you liked the flavor of, do that one again next year. Add four different varieties. Or you could say, okay, I'm gonna grow all five varieties for two years, except for the one that I didn't like to eat very much. I'll grow the other four just in case it was an off year. Maybe climate change threw me off or something. So I'm gonna do it again, you know? Maybe I made something wrong in the soil mix, whatever. So you try it a couple of times and then you get the same results. You know that, um, you know, you know which beans are great. I figured out that uh, yard long beans, the giant Asian beans, were the absolute best, most productive green bean for Florida. But once I knew that, I tried different varieties of it. I got the purple variety and they tasted like cardboard. They were beautiful, but they tasted like cardboard, they were more fibrous, and they weren't as productive. So I went back to the green, the boring green ones that produced like an insane amount. So, you know, you can always ask me questions, you can ask other gardeners questions, but I, I want you to just go out and plant something. And don't go plant your entire yard all at once unless you're feeling super ambitious. Take a small space, take a four by four, take a few pots, make a four by eight, you know. Uh, conquer that area, make some compost, make your first batch of compost, throw it on there, see what happens, you know. Um, and, and you will learn bit by bit. You'll learn what works, you'll learn what doesn't, you'll learn which things grow and which things don't. Plant a bunch of different stuff, enjoy it. It's a lot of fun. You know, when you get your first cucumber, your first green beans, um, your first fruit from a seedling tree, it's the, it's amazing. You think it's the most beautiful thing you ever saw in the world. You want to like Instagram it, you know, and that's, that's great. And that's pride that comes from hard work and doing, you know, doing a good job. So that is what I wanted to tell you. The best, the best way to start gardening is to start gardening and to keep gardening and to realize you're not a failure if you screw up. That's how we learn. Just chalk it up as another learning experience, go to the next thing. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing to have those learning experiences because they, they will teach you more and more and more than any book will ever teach you. So that's my talk for tonight. And I am going to answer some questions here and see what everybody's writing. So <laughs> you guys picking on Pete Canaris again? You know, Pete Canaris is greater than me. You know, Pete Canaris actually didn't have to learn how to garden. He just like instantly started when he was a kid. <laughs> All right, let me see. I'm going to go back a little bit here. Wholesome Root says, we planted three different fruit trees, three figs, and eight blueberries yesterday. Good work. I planted a whole bunch of different varieties of blueberries, southern high bush and rabbit eyes. Found out the rabbit eyes were definitely the best uh, for, for where I was. And I just, I just, I recorded a great, um, great, like 20 minutes on blueberry farming with uh, Bill Hall of uh, B&G Blueberries, and I'm going to post that soon. Really good, but there's a lot of editing involved, and I'm, I'm still catching up after my trip and having my, uh, my mom visit for a couple of weeks and go traveling and all that stuff. So... 
Somebody came in with that thumbs down. Yeah, there's somebody that just loves to do that. It's hilarious. I, I get, um, I, I banned a couple of people this last week just for being obnoxious. Uh, you know, I was wearing my 100% uh, vegan compost shirt the other day, and this guy's like, LOL, you know, hating people who love animals, so great of you, something like that. And it was like, I, I don't know, his hashtag was like vegan idiot, you know, or whatever. So I was like, yeah, goodbye, you know. Um, it's funny. You can pry my bacon from my cold dead hands. Um, and, and then I, I got some other guy, you know, lecturing, like lecturing me in all caps, sections of caps and then sections of not, you know, don't you think such and such is the case? Why didn't you tell us that in the video? I'm like, I don't have to explain every single thing in every single video. So I just wrote back, I said, just look it up. Just look it up. I gave you the names. It was the, the avocado one. I gave you the names of the variety. Look up the variety names. Just look them up. I'm not covering everything. I'm letting, I'm letting my guests speak. So it's like, why didn't you tell us how cold they take? Well, because I didn't have the University of Florida website in front of me at the moment. I mean, I don't have to be like the, the complete repository of all information. Anyhow, so um, I, said, I said, just look it up. And he responds, you always reply to me sarcastically. You love nothing but praise. You know, you have a, a horrible whatever, whatever, whatever. And it was like, no, everybody hates people like you, bud. Everybody hates the person that comes in and shows up and wants to lecture you um, on proper pronunciation or that, uh, you know, this is actually a grass. Did you know it's a grass? I didn't mention it this time that it was a grass, but yes, I knew that. Thank you so much. You sound like you're being sarcastic when you say thank you. You don't take my, my great helpfulness on the internet seriously. So anyhow, I just have started to see the patterns. <laughs> Gone. But, um, but it is actually funny. I, I was thinking later, I should have saved some of the comments because there, there's some humdingers. So I, I don't know if one of those is the thumbs down guy, but it's pretty funny. Like, I, I, I would have... Um, I would have a less entertaining life if it wasn't for those folks, but but sometimes you get a bunch of them in one day, and you're just like, okay, I'm just so done with this. Just ban everybody. Uh, you know. Uh, Mike from Trinidad says, shout out from Trinidad and Tobago. Trinidad and Tobago. Man, you got some great um, fruit tree varieties there. Great jungle there. That's that's something. That's a place I would love to visit, both, both Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> Dana, <laughs> Dana says, millions of dead plants gave the thumbs down. Austin and Gene says, I stacked tires one year and grew potatoes and then with straw. Yeah, we tried doing that and we, we killed the potatoes, but I think we were a little too ambitious with how much straw we packed on them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> controversial Chris says, I blame Pete Canaris for every thumbs down in David's video. No, Pete Canaris is so awesome that when he gives a thumbs down, it's actually a thumbs up just because Pete Canaris paid attention to your video. David Hardesty said, has anyone grow, grown jicama? Yes, I actually grew jicama one year um, on accident because I gave a friend some seeds to start and he came back and he's like, I, I started a bunch of these seeds that you gave me and uh, here are some of those beans that you gave me. So I, I planted the bean plants, but they didn't look normal to me. They looked a little weird and they grew really vigorously and they started putting on these purple blooms and they had these big raggedy looking bean leaves. And I was like, my gosh, I think this is kudzu. And I'm looking up kudzu online. I'm like, this looks like kudzu. Found out later um, when I dug up I dug up one of the roots, it was jicama. But I thought for sure I was growing a kudzu for a bit. <laughs> I gotta try it again. It's probably the Illuminati giving me the thumbs down. <laughs> Jan says, I've been learning to garden since I was two or three. 60 plus years later, I'm still learning. You never stop learning when it comes to gardening. That's awesome, Jan. Good work. Keep growing. Now, Pete Canaris is not evil. <laughs> that I know of. He might be a little <laughs> CJ says, have grown onions from just trimming off roots and planting them. Natasha says, the very best thing about gardening is that you never stop learning. It's awesome for a learning junkie. Yeah, I agree. It is. It's, it, I mean, there's so much to learn. Um, there are so many plants in the world, I could never identify them all. People send me pictures of weeds all the time. Can you identify this? I can identify some of them, and I'm pretty decent at finding plant families, but I'm stumped as often as not. 
there are just, there's millions of plants in the world. I don't have them all, you know? If they're like common Florida weeds, I got it. Some of the common pan-tropical weeds, I got it. Okay, that's some sort of purslane. That looks like it might be a talinum. Um, that is probably Malvaceae family that looks like it by the leaves, but you gotta show me the blooms. Maybe I can nail it down for you. You kind of, you get closer over time as you, as you learn to identify, but uh, yeah, you know, you just, <laughs> yeah, you get it. <clears throat> uh, Colleen says, I just found a bunch of sprouting potatoes. A sprouting onion and some ginger in the back of my pantry. Time to plant in big pots. I have wet, heavy clay here in western Washington. Yeah, I, I actually wrote an article for Heirloom Gardener magazine on growing ginger and turmeric. And they, they do very well in pots, actually, in a, in a colder climate like that. You'll do fine. You'll do fine. It's, and it's a lot of fun. If it doesn't, you don't get a lot of roots the first year, the second year you'll get more roots. Uh, Michael, a.k.a. Pigmaster. I was at my grandma's house in Lake County and some of the soil was absolute black and amazing because the wood from the dock had rotted and I found sweet potato vines everywhere covering everything. It's amazing. It was probably, the wood might be full of arsenic, but uh, the sweet potato vines wouldn't mind. Uh, let's see here. Wholesome Roots had a great loss of one of her firstborn goats at the homestead, sending her love. Yeah, that's that's rough. It is hard. Heather Martin says, I read Crazy Easy Florida Gardening and wanted to say thank you. I would never have continued gardening if it were not for you. Thank you very much. That's that's very kind. That's what I hoped. I hoped I would encourage people into saying, you know what? Florida's not a bad place to garden. You can do it. And uh, people have agreed because, um, I, so far as I can tell, I think it's the best-selling gardening, Florida gardening book on Amazon, um, just judging by the rankings. It's pretty cool. <laughs> David Hayes says, taxation is theft. Yeah, no problem with that. Deanna says, are Chinese noodle beans and yardlung beans the same thing? Not sure. Sometimes it's called, um, sometimes it's called uh, snake beans. It's another name for it. Food Forest Permaculture says, Hello, David the Good and fellow Earthlings. <laughs> Michael says, I have 27 jackfruit trees from seeds in pots. That's awesome. Okay, David Hayes, don't keep saying taxation is theft. We get it. <laughs> You're not just hailing more than one. Let's keep saying it. Uh, Nathaniel says, Tomatoes have been a slow learning process. Yeah, it's like the first thing everybody wants to grow, and it's not the easiest thing to grow unless you have the perfect climate for it. see yeah we got a lot of folks here Nancy says I don't understand why people can't look up stuff when they're given initial information yes David we do hate them it's just that uh, there are some people like who just they're the subject matter expert and they feel like their job is to fix everybody else's misconceptions but what really gets me is when they're they're doing something that's actually not correct and then lecturing other people on it or coming in with such a, you know, very rudely. They don't realize how many, how many times I get told the same thing. You, you just get, get tired of it over time. It's like, okay, I've heard 100 times that I shouldn't have put a bottom on the compost pile in that video that I recorded three years ago on a whim. I put a bottom in the compost pile because I didn't want the tree roots to come up through it because it was right next to a citrus tree and the tree roots would come up through the compost. So I just blocked them out. But everybody has to tell me over and over again that I need to let the worms in. Well, guess not. Guess what? Worms crawl around at night. They'll go up into the compost pile around it. But anyhow, it's like it's just not worth explaining anymore. Um, it's pretty funny. Brian Rosado says. Uh, do you have stinking toe growing or are you going to plant some on your new property? I don't have any stinking toe growing, but yes, I am going to plant some right from seed. I'm going to stick the seeds right in the ground. Uh, Nationalism Rising sends a $5 super chat. Thank you very much. It says, watched your video on mastering trees recently. Should trees be in the ground and well-established before you start pruning 
them to control them? That is a good question. You can prune trees in the pots. I mean, after all, bonsai is a, a method of keeping trees in pots. Generally, though, what you want to do is get your tree in the ground as soon as possible where you want it to grow up and be. I don't see any reason to leave them in pots unless you're really afraid the deer are going to eat them or it's a really rare variety and you're afraid if you put it out it's too dry, it's going to die, you got to grow it a little bigger, that sort of thing. You know, you feel like you have to baby it for a time. But I would I would put them in the ground and, and have them uh, established as best as possible. Now, one thing you can do that works really well is if you plant bare root trees, chop them off while they're still bare root because actively growing trees suffer much more from the pruning than a bare root tree would. So if you, if you get a chance to you plant your, you know, you plant your bare root trees in fall and you prune them before they wake up in the spring, cut them real low so they're going to branch out when they wake up, they barely notice that they've been pruned. That works great. If it's, if they're really actively growing and there's a lot of rain and then you chop them back and they're trying to survive transplant shock, that's a bad time. It would be better to have them established if you're going to prune while they're actively growing. So that's my two cents on that. But thank you very much for the super chat. Much appreciated. Uh, let's see what we got here. Hugh says, tomatoes seem to like 7B. Spit the seeds in the ground and they come up. Yeah, I had great luck with, uh, with them in Tennessee. I had bad luck with them in Florida. Tennessee, I was border of 6 and 7. South Texas Gardening says, hey David, when can I let my fig cutting go off without a mini greenhouse? Mini greenhouse water bottle. They are three weeks old and have a good amount of leaves, but when I let them go, the leaves wilt and shrivel. Yeah, I'd give them a couple of months to root up before I take them out. You can adjust them a little bit at a time, like by taking the cover off for an hour or so, but chances are they don't have the root system to support the leaves yet, so I would, I would just wait a couple more weeks. Sometimes they'll actually leaf out before they root well, and you definitely have to keep them covered in that case. I've got some uh, mulberries that I'm starting right now, and it's the same thing. Related, too. Colleen says, I have a huge pile of wood chips that I let sit all fall, and now looks like black gold with fungi and worms. Can I lay that over my clay soil and plant straight in it? Yes. Um, I would... I would probably dig into it a little bit and plant directly in the clay, but but I would put that stuff over and around the plants. And chances are, if it if it's if it's rotted that much, that it's got lots of fungi and worms in it, um, it's probably not going to suck up the nitrogen. But you may have to just foliar your feed. If the plants yellow up, you could probably plant right into it. But if the uh, plants yellow up at all, foliar feed them um, with something diluted urine, uh, fish emulsion, something like that. Miracle Grow. This has been sponsored by Miracle Grow Scotts. Um, Misguided Mind Bullet says, I keep a jar of iron powder in the shed for tomatoes next to the Epsom salts. I've also recently heard that you can throw two Tums antacid under the plant for calcium. That's cool. Good idea. Uh, you can also you know, grind up eggshells and put them underneath. Misguided Mind Bullet said, that's it, I just watered my tomatoes with some milk I forgot to put back in the fridge overnight. That's awesome. Milk is actually a really good fertilizer. You might thin it out a little bit, but... I'm your Huckleberry says, for Moringa tree, for the Moringa tea, do you dry the leaves or just boil the green? I've done both. Both are good. David Hardesty says, morning glory is a nightmare in my garden. Yeah, the... <laughs> We call it bindweed in the southern United States. It's awful. John Anderson says, Come on, David. Happy birthday. Marilyn Monroe's version for my birthday. Do I look like Marilyn Monroe? Happy birthday to John. Happy birthday to John. What are you doing? you all here but I have this fear that you 
don't have very good friends. So happy birthday to John. Happy birthday. I wish you were gone to someplace nicer than my live stream with some pina coladas and lots of pretty girls. I, I hope that's good. It's not exactly Marilyn Monroe's version. Probably a little less throaty. Uh, Colleen sends a ten dollars super chat. Thanks, David. Well, I very much appreciate it. Thank you. Do it. Plant. Uh, LaRue OBR556 says, can I get fava beans from a grocery store and sprout? Yes. Um, I've done it. They sprout. They grow well. Uh, I got mine from Whole Foods. It's like one of my major seed suppliers. The bulk bins at Whole Foods. Brian says, how's the coconut palm doing with the seawater? Very well. And we've actually gotten a bunch of rain lately, and I put a bunch of uh, seaweed around it. So it looks very green and happy, and it's, it's growing. So I, I want to put more on it. <laughs> Jan says, I put old yogurt in my compost today. Hey, it's good stuff. I, I've used it for uh, foliar spray to uh, knock out fungal infections. A little bit of yogurt. Um, Keith the Bad, Keith the Bad says, <laughs> I never have luck with tomatoes. Get great fruit and then the stink bugs get them. Would it be a good idea to grow them in containers and bring them in during stink bug season? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother to go that far. But my friend Mart Hale, who's maybe on tonight, um, Mart is brilliant, and what he did was he bought mosquito netting, and he strung it over his garden beds as the tomatoes started to produce, and the mosquito netting kept all the stink bugs out, so he he didn't have any trouble. I don't know if he puts it over earlier in the season or like right before they produce or what. Harold Hung says, "Can you fertilize root crops with your compost stew? Why not? Right? Yeah, I do it all the time." Um, good, we're getting a lot of happy birthdays for John. <laughs> Sasquatchsagas.com says, do I look like Marilyn Monroe? Depends on what one has been eating out of their mushroom garden. Hey, I think I got a better figure than Marilyn. At least around the waist, right? A great waist. If I suck it in, I have a great waist. The Great Pineapple says, if you trim a tree, does the womb turn black? She turned to me, looked at me. If I trim a tree, does the womb turn black? That is a weird question. I think you mean, does the wound turn black black hole wound no okay that's enough we're going to stop doing that we have to keep it under control if you trim a tree does the wound turn black yeah it can it gets fungi infections that sort of thing um it's best to it's best to to not cut huge cuts out of a tree and um you know to cut them with a little bit of a slant that helps yes <laughs> Pigmaster says, you need some noni trees. I have one. I brought it over to the property. I haven't planted it yet. <laughs> Carolyn Smith says, hi, guys. Hey, Carolyn. Nice to see you here. Natasha says, got a bunch of fun sweet potatoes from Whole Foods. Blew the cashier's mind that you could plant them. Yeah, the grocery store is a great place to get plantable material. That is the way to do it. You are officially a good gardener. <laughs> Huckerberry says, does adding rust help plants at all? I don't know. Some some forms are usable and some forms are not. Like if we drink rusty water, it just kind of builds the rust. The iron oxide builds up in your system. I actually have a friend who um, is a nutritionist, P.D. Mangan. Very good nutritionist. And he gives blood regularly to lower his iron count because iron accumulates in the system, particularly in men and causes health problems as you get older. Iron is actually not a great thing when you get too much of it. But for but there are some, some ways iron is really readily absorbed and some ways it's not. Sometimes it just passes right through. So, uh, Leaf says, do you have babaco? Babaco? 
That's a real thing? Let me go look. That's got to be a common name for something. Do you have Mavico? What the heck is this thing? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen one of these things. This is a weird thing. No, you know, I had that. That's the mountain papaya. I always called it mountain papaya. That, um, no, I don't have any. I would like to get some. I, I had seeds for it back in Florida. I grew it and then I lost the, the plant. So, uh, Jan Penland says, I use diluted yogurt or buttermilk to knock out downy mildew. That's the way to do it. It works. You're, you're adding more competition to the system, it kills it. It's amazing. Rusty water. Rusty water. Do your tree wounds turn black? It's good. Sue says, Hi, David. Love your channel. Well, thank you, Sue. Much appreciated. Sasquatch Saga says, Did you notice anything from your seawater feed of your coconut? Yes, it's looking much better. Much better. All right, have a good night, John. Happy birthday. God bless. Joel Kane says, I'm in zone 9B in California and going to try some tropicals. Was wondering how important humidity is. For some things, it's very important. Like for uh, cocoa, you can't grow it without a certain level of humidity. It can be very, very important. Um, some of your tropical plants simply will lose their leaves and die. But there are different tropical climates all around the world. There are tropical arid climates and there are tropical humid climates. I would try to concentrate on the trees from tropical humid climates. Things like... Uh, Figs, pomegranates, dates. Um, there, there are plenty of things that can take it. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, have a good night, Food Forest Permaculture. Um, Misguided Mind Bolt says, Iron turns your hydrangeas different colors. My great-grandma used to stick iron nails in the dirt near the roots. Yeah, I guess it's better than spray painting them. Deanna says, natural way to kill cucumber beetles. Well, yeah, you can, I, you know, what I often did was I just got, I got a little bowl and I put a couple of drops of soap in it and put some water in the bowl and I would just go and knock them all in. But um, you could probably boil some cigar butts, add a little soap to it and spray everything. It makes your garden smell amazing, but it kills stuff. You might try hot peppers, um, hot pepper juice. Uh, you see if um, you can deter them with uh, garlic spray, or you could go hardcore and get some neem oil. David Clark says, I know someone that swears by putting a pack of matches under his tomatoes. Have you heard of that? I heard something along those lines, burying matches, probably for the phosphorus. Oh, banjo playing is coming along. I'm learning it. I was talking about it earlier. Um, getting there, one bit at a time. Matthew Kaziah says, can you grow tropical arid plants indoors? Just sun and no water, right? Can you grow tropical arid plants indoors? Yeah, I mean, you can because generally generally the, the climate indoors is drier than the climate outdoors, um, depending on where you live. I mean, you might be humidifying your house, but uh, it's just hard to grow a lot of things well indoors because they really like a little breeze and they like a little rain and you've got to kind of play God and get them enough water but not too much water or the roots will rot and they've got to have enough light and so you've got to do that artificially and put it on timers. It's just a lot of trouble. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's see. The Great Pineapple says, like my school has two flowering medium trees and both of them are pruned, but they have like mold because I look at those trees and they have like big cuts and mold. It's still living, but there's mold. Yeah, they'll probably grow out of it. The mold is probably feeding on the sap on the outside. Now, if it starts to turn black and eat into the tree, then you've got like a canker issue or something. That can happen. You can um, spray compost tea on the cuts, which can help. So... <clears throat> I'm your Huckleberry says, are blogs really dead? Yeah, um, I mean, my my site does quite well because of how many articles I've written and on how many topics. 
So when somebody searches Google, they find me as the top on many topics. Like I think uh, how to grow pawpaws from seed, I'm like right at the top. Um, Florida mushroom, edible Florida mushrooms, I'll be right near the top. Best mushroom uh, books, best books on mushroom foraging, I'm like one of the top ones. Because I've, I've written, when I'm really interested in something, I'll do a bunch of research on it and then I'll do a, a big post on it and set the SEO so you know Google finds me. So I don't know how many posts I have now. Let me see. See how many posts I'm up to. I've got it right here. Check my dashboard. How many posts do I have? I am up to 2,037 posts. I've been pu publishing a post almost every day for a long time. Before this, I had a couple of other blogs, but they were not gardening related, except occasionally. And I, I killed all those and just did the gardening thing. Aaron says, anyone get a Japanese raisin tree to maturity? I, I I used to have one, and it was a beautiful little tree, but I think I gave it to uh, Scrubland Avenger. Karen Hill says, can you air layer in multiple places on a branch if it is big enough or only near the growing tip? I don't know. I don't know, because you would be breaking off the flow of sap twice, so I probably wouldn't. I've never seen anybody do it, but you could always try it and see what happens. I don't know why you would need to do it, though, unless you were trying to save propagated material. David Hardesty says, how do you get pawpaw to grow faster? They are so slow. They are slow. I don't know. I would, I would say probably lots of mulch. Sue Young says, I'm in South Florida. We need lots of biomass. My neighbors just dumped a truckload of paddle cactus. Will the spines break down in the compost? Or will they stay evil for a long time? They probably stay evil for a pretty long time. They would break down eventually. My would be more concerned about all that stuff rooting. It's really hard to compost cactus because it all roots. It grows like crazy. The Great Pineapple says, My neighbor's avocado tree is slowly dying, dying because... It's leaves, it's turning brown and maybe be mold or fungus. It is probably laurel wilt disease, which is a very common disease. Uh, causes a lot of dieback on avocados and members of the Bay family. Hart Nundus says, my great uncle planted. My great uncle planted ever bearing strawberries, but he eventually got rid of them because they weren't producing Enough. Do you know any tricks to getting ever bearers to fruit more? Yes, I do. When I was a master gardener long ago, my master gardener friend told me she got tons of strawberries with a single little trick. It was called fish emulsion. Apparently they love diluted fish emulsion on a regular schedule. It makes them happy. The other thing you can do is, um, the other thing with the everbearing strawberries, don't let them put a lot of energy into runners. If they put a lot of energy into making runners, it's energy they're not putting into fruit, so you you take your runners off. Don't let them run all over the place. They're they're either gonna they're either gonna make more leaves and runners, or they're gonna make more fruit, and you want them to make more fruit. So time it up. Natasha says, "Ah, oh, the strumming and the lag reminds me of my dad. He used to do that. God bless him. I uh, a lot of things remind me of my dad. Sometimes it just hits you out of the blue, something silly, you know." Brian says, how do you feel about growing mango trees from seeds? I love growing mango trees from seeds. However, um, the varieties that they produce are not necessarily all that great. Um, if you started with a one from a good mango that was grown in an orchard, you know, you might get a good mango or you might get a little turpentiny fruit. I, I haven't grown but one to maturity and as it was getting ready to fruit, I sold my plant nursery and the guy got it so I don't know if it ever made good fruit. There's a seedling mango at the property we first rented when we got here, and its fruit was 
so so um, but the locals will say that they generally kind of produce the type so they think if you plant like uh, say a Ceylon mango you're gonna get a variety like that so if you plant like super delicious mango pit you're probably more likely to get a good fruit out of it than if you planted you know stringy turpentine variety um, but the, the the cool thing is with mangoes if you grow them from seed, you can use that for a rootstock and graft right on top. I've got a seedling mango on my property right now, and there's a mango tree down the street that I really like the fruit from that nobody sells or has that I've seen elsewhere. So I'm going to take some cyan wood off it and graft it. So that seedling mango is going to be converted. Matthew says, is getting the Master Gardener title worth the time and work? Oh, good question. This is one of my controversial opinions. Just a second here. I'm going to send you a link. I'm going to send you a link. This is a little mean. And this made some master gardeners angry, but if you're interested in the master gardener thing, here's my thoughts. I met now, now I did meet some great people in the program. I enjoyed some people that were in it, but yeah, and it may depend on your program too. We had a very good program, but it was not for me where I was, but you can read and see. Aaron says, wife just got mad at me for filling in the backyard with mulch. She said, I have a problem, so I come here for therapy. Tell her she's sleeping on the sofa. Wholesome Root says, I love your plant. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Many subtropical... Wait, so we're going to start the... Subtropical trees say they are okay. They're okay. 20 degrees. Oh, here we go. Many subtropical trees say they're all okay. 20 degrees. I'm on the coast there. Myrtle Beach, so my temperatures stay just inside that reach. How old do the trees have to be to survive that 20 degrees? Minimum. That was Amy Kay singing right there. Uh, usually the trees, as they get older, they gain a lot more frost tolerance. So the cold tolerance goes up. So I wrote in... Push the zone. Oh, I got my copy of it here somewhere. Push the zone. Where did I put it? I don't know where I put it. My book, Push the Zone, that's one of the things that I did quite a bit of study on. And um, the guy that wrote the, the intro for me, um, Palms Won't Grow Here and Other Myths. Son of a gun, I'm not remembering his name at the moment. Dr. Franco. Dr. Franco. So Dr. Franco was was really interested in like how long does it take a tree to become more frost tolerant, and as they get bigger, they grow, they gain frost tolerance. So your your young tree, even if it says can survive to 12 degrees, a young tree may be frozen to the ground. Like my olive tree was supposed to take 12 degrees. I planted it out. It was a little stick. It was like this tall, and it started to started to grow, and it made it looked pretty decent, and then it froze to the ground. We got weather in the teens it froze it all the way to the ground above 12 degrees it was more than 12 degrees out and it froze it all the way to the ground it grew back again the next year but it looks weird and that's because the adult degrees that it can take is way different and it's usually about 10 degrees different it's pretty amazing and if you think about how much water is in a trunk and how much thermal mass is there it kind of makes sense it takes a lot more energy to freeze through a big tree than it does to freeze through a small one Plus the canopy acts as a huge blanket. You got a little stick, that thing is gonna die. But if you've got a thick tree with a big canopy, it can take a lot more. I don't get cold nearly as fast as a little baby would get cold. So I can go swimming in the ocean and um, do pretty well, but the baby's lips might be turning blue, you know. Oh, poor baby. So you gotta, you gotta watch out for those little trees and take care of them. Um, probably I would say three, four years. <laughs> Jan says, I have a friend in Fort Pierce that says the turpentiny mangoes are the best. I've watched her eat four or five at a time. Yeah, she's a lizard. You know the lizards live among us. They wear human masks. Uh, turpentine mangoes are the best. <laughs> Kenneth says, I'm in South Southwest Florida. I love your channel. Thank you very much. Guitar Man by Bread. Okay, we can do that. 
We can do that. No, 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 no. We can do that. Why not? It's after an hour, you know, guys. I'm just like burning it up right here. Just burning up the night. Burn up the night. Turpentine mangoes. slide guitar part. Don't laugh. That is the slide guitar. That's exactly what it sounds like. Who draws a crowd and plays so loud, baby, it's a guitar man. Who's gonna steal the show, you know, baby, it's a guitar man. He can make you love, he can make you cry. It's finished for the most part. I, uh, I got it all finished and locked and I probably lost the keys to it. <laughs> Board Again Bear says, is it good to have moisture in a compost bin? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, a lot of times the compost piles will stop uh, composting because they're too dry. They, they make a lot of steam. They dry out quickly sometimes and, um, and it helps to water them down. You can get them started again. No problem. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> Shed picks. Yeah, I got to do that. Anolis A says, uh, in Ethiopia, they grind and ferment the inner core of false banana to make a starchy bread-like substance. Any idea if the same can be done with an actual banana plant? I don't know, but I think the false banana they're talking about, um, there's multiple members of that greater family, like, um, you know, you've got your, your gingers and uh, arrowroot and some other things that have more starch production. You can eat the center of a banana, apparently, but it's not super starchy. David says, would you play the uke playing behind me? Yeah, it sounds pretty good. 
Let me see if I can I'll unhook it. All right, all right, we're done with gardening questions now. I'll, I'll well, I'll answer a few. Maybe I'll sing them. Uh, I have it all tied up here, so it's like it's not the you know it's not the most efficient thing. It doesn't have a proper hanger, you know. This is the one I built right here. See, so yeah, you can see it, and now that I was wearing, I'm wearing my nice pants. These are my like work on the land pants. I was up at the land a little while ago. Perfect intonation. I built it myself. It's a mahogany top, local mahogany, a piece of um, very hard driftwood that I found that I used for here uh, for the bridge and the tailpiece. Piece of bone from one of my neighbor's cows. Um, piece of strip of bamboo around the edge, and the back is a calabash gourd. So it's not a perfect instrument. It sounds kind of old, but it doesn't stay tuned very well, and it tends to go out a little on the intonation. I I nailed in the um, frets myself, so it's a little. It's a little less than ideal, but it's it's fun to noodle around on. And uh, I, there's a few design changes I would make. This is how we learn, right? We, we fail, we make mistakes, we figure out that we didn't do the intonation quite correctly, and then the next one we fix. So. Oh, that song, yeah, that's that was Guitar Man by Brad there. <clears throat> uh, David Clark says, I love your live stream and long trips. Very entertaining. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, let's see. Let me get here. Natasha says, "I know we all love gardening, but I got to say the music is what it makes it fun and awesome." I can see the like the the viewers drop off a little bit sometimes when I'm playing. It's like some there's some people that are just here for like it's information, it's information, it's information, which I completely understand. So, uh, but other people could could. Totally like music, man, or just all over the place. Let's do some music. Um, Hugh says, Can we have bad dreams for the closer? Yes, I can do that. Karen says, My husband thinks I'm crazy that I watch these live streams. You must be crazy. You're watching David the Good. Uh, Mad Jeeper, New Hampshire says, My fingertips are now reminding me how long it's been since I jammed on my guitar. Oh, you gotta play more, man. It's the best. It's so good. So. Oh, let's see. All right, have a good night, Leaf. <clears throat> Wholesome Roots says, David, do you ever guest star on other channels' li lives? No, I haven't done that. I would do it. I would do it. No problem. It would be fun. I should make a drum. It's on my list of things to do. I'm going to cut open a palm and take the center of, take the, the soft part out of the middle and make a drum. Stretch a goat skin. Yes, I do brew my own alcohol. Uh, if your wine and cider turns out bad, just run it through your wife's pressure cooker, put a little um, coil of uh, copper on there, and turn it into vodka. Yep. <laughs> uh, the house, I, I, had a, um, I had a contractor, another contractor come over today and look, we're going to start building very soon. We should be pegging, marking off the bottoms of it now soon. I actually got to go meet with him tomorrow morning. It'll be fun. So, Jeremy's Homestead says, Hello, it's Deb here. I'm new to your channel. This is my first time watching. Well, welcome. Nice to have you here. We're kind of coming to the end, but um, glad you're here. Yeah, email is the best way to contact me. David at FloridaFoodForests.com Daniel says, Can you graft year-round? Yes, but there are times that you have much more success and times that you'll have many more failures. Just coming out of dormancy is the best time. Um... For like whip and tongue grafting that sort of thing. Brendan says, any plans to do progression videos on the house build? Yes, probably. I'm just still way behind in my editing for my Florida trip. I haven't even gotten to the next bit. 
Mm. All right, so Bad Dreams. We're going to finish with, uh, with Bad Dreams here. This is a song that I wrote called Bad Dreams. Well, I lay down to bed around the middle of the night. And I feel so hungry I had to get up for a bite. So I looked in the fridge for something good to you know. Probably made a pile out of everything I saw. Well, I should have known better than to pack up my gut when I eat that snack food I deserve when I got bad dreams all night, all night, all night. Bad dreams, bad dreams, bad dreams. Well, first I made a sandwich with four slices of bread. I didn't have mayo, so I used ketchup instead. Grabbed a slice of ham and some other kind of meat. Packed in some marshmallows, topped it off neat then. Bad dreams all night, all night. Very, very bad dreams all night, all night. Oh, a string of sausages, a full cup of cream, a bag of pork rinds, and a pitcher of T12 donuts, plus some broccoli and cheese. 15 gummies from a box of jelly beans. And gonna have bad dreams all night, all night. Very, very bad dreams all night, all night. did me in. Could it have been the eggs or the shrimp? Or that innocent sorbet? Or maybe it was the walnut bread my wife left out the night before. All I know was, when I went back to bed, my sleep was fitful. And inside my head were all of these bad dreams all night, all night bad dreams. Remember? What were the bad dreams that I had? They were very, very bad dreams. You ready? You want to hear my bad dreams? Well, I was chased by a sausage riding in a car. I almost drowned inside a peanut butter jar. Had a falling out with a girl made of beef. Caught wearing nothing in the produce aisle, but I'll leave. Yes, I had so many, many dreams. Very, very bad. That's bad dreams. One of these days I'll give you all a proper recording of it, you know, be fun. Um, uh, one of the plans for the new property is to have a proper uh, office slash recording studio, cast concrete, so it's quiet, so we don't hear goats and crickets and screaming children and um, chainsaws and, you know, just the normal stuff of, of living, in, living in a crazy equatorial jungle, so... Bad beans. <laughs> so I'm actually going to have space um, to uh, to record properly. This is like like even voicing an audiobook here is difficult. I, I voice in this closet right behind me. Look at this. See the padding on the inside? That's where I voiced my nursery book. And that's where I should be voicing Jack Broccoli, but I haven't gotten around to it. So anyhow... Um, God bless you all, and uh, and have a good night. I, I just want you guys to go and garden, even if you garden badly. There's no such thing as, as like brown thumbs, black thumbs, whatever, unless those are the colors of your thumbs that the Lord gave you. Hallelujah. Um, you're not going to fail. You know, you're, you, you, you're not going to fail if you keep going. <laughs> That's right. You'll fail. We'll all fail. We fail again and again and again. 
but uh, each one of those failures is a chance to learn and get better. So just just go out and start gardening, for goodness sakes. So, yeah, you know, um, <laughs> I like hearing the kids in the background, too. Uh, it doesn't usually bother me during the day, but when, like, you're recording a guitar part or something, and it's like, you hear this, like, crying baby or something, and you're like, okay, I mean, sometimes I, infants have this way of sounding like their mom is torturing them to death, and they might want a package of crackers that's on the counter, and they're like, ah! and you know, people that don't have children, they're like, those parents must be horrible. They're torturing a baby to death in the next room. He's just playing the guitar over there, and there's somebody torturing a baby to death. How are you missing this? How are you just sitting there and playing with somebody torturing a baby? And meanwhile, like, like my wife's getting the, it's like, I don't know if you should eat any more crackers. Why don't you eat your oatmeal? You know, it's like, you might as well just say, you don't get a cracker until you tell me. Tell me where you hid the loot. Tell me where you hid the loot or you're not getting a cracker. You know, no, give me a cracker. Ah, give me a cracker. You know, so it's insane. Kids are really crazy. They're not rational. It's pretty hilarious. Anyhow, have a very good night. Um, God bless you guys, and uh, I will see you probably tomorrow. I'm going to go over to the land in the in the morning, or I'm going to meet with, meet with this contractor again and sketch out some ideas. We've got some cool ideas. So have a great night, and until next time, may your thumbs always be great.